Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to a panel discussion on community benefits. Thank you for joining us. My name is Sean Strickland. I'm executive director of Canada's Building Trades Unions. And it's my pleasure to moderate this panel discussion this afternoon. Canada's Building Trades Unions is also the sponsor of this session and is pleased to sponsor the CCP3 conference this year. Canada's Building Trades Unions, we are an affiliation of 14 international unions. We have 600,000 members from coast to coast, busy constructing, maintaining, and fabricating construction projects right across the country. And uh, we are really pleased to participate in this year's conference and also continue our heavy involvement with P3s right across Canada. So today's panel discussion is on community benefits and how do we amplify infrastructure dollars to maximize impact. Uh, CBAs, community benefit agreements, typically place requirements on contractors working on projects in partnership with local communities to increase opportunities for women, apprentices and racialized Canadians and underrepresented groups. So the main objective of community benefit agreements is to create opportunities for folks within our communities that don't normally have that opportunity to work on infrastructure projects. And joining me today are some subject matter experts on community benefit agreements. We have Christian Jenkins from Crosslinks. We have Lionel Railton from the International Union of Operating Engineers. And we also have Elise Martini from the Kansas City Building Trades who is currently in technological limbo trying to access this uh, panel discussion. So we hope Elise will be able to join us in a minute. So I'm wondering just to kick things off, uh, Lionel, you're based in BC, you're intimately familiar with community benefits in British Columbia. And actually community benefits were an election topic uh, and some much point of discussion during the last provincial election. So can you maybe tell us how community benefit agreements work in, in British Columbia and what your experience has been with them? Uh, thank you, Sean, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, our experience here in British Columbia stems back uh, 50 plus years uh, with a um, community benefits agreement, uh, which was established for the development of uh, hydro generation in British Columbia. It was the Allied Hydro Council Agreement. And the new model that's, uh, or the evolved model that's now being deployed in British Columbia, it's early days, uh, is been developed uh, through uh, the, the uh, previous minority government and now a majority government, the NDP. Um, and they established a provincial crown corporation um, and it's labeled uh, the British Columbia Infrastructure Benefits Corporation or BCIB. And BCIB is essentially the employer for all employees that um, are employed on these community benefit uh, projects in British Columbia. And they stem in three veins, basically road building, institutional and um, bridge replacement are the three projects that are going at this particular time. And the um, BCIB is, uh, as the host and the employer of all the employees that go to work on these projects, is ensuring that there is um, uh, ample opportunity for local residents where these projects will be taking place. Secondly, and opportunities for underrepresented groups. And it really is meeting the need of a well-documented skill shortages and uh, projected skill shortages going forward in Canada, in Canada and particularly in British Columbia. So the projects uh, are moving forward. Uh, everybody has an opportunity to um, work on these projects uh, based under the criteria that's been established by the provincial government. And all contractors within the province and outside of the province have the opportunity to bid on these projects as well. So uh, early days, but things are going well, Sean. Uh, th thanks, Lionel. Just maybe just to, can you just uh, just tease out a little bit more before we get to Christian? Um, BCIB. So, so what specifically is that? And is that a government department or a ministry? How, how does that govern uh, and manage in British Columbia? It's a newly formed Crown Corporation. Uh, so it's a BC uh, Provincial Crown Corporation. And it was established, established specifically to administer community benefits and the criteria outlined, outlined by uh, the provincial government. Okay, great. 
Uh, Kristen, how about your experience on, on Crosslinks, also known as Eglinton Crosstown, one of the largest infrastructure projects in Canada? Uh, what's your experience being with community benefits uh, and how are they working? Okay, thanks, Sean, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Eglinton Crosstown is a new 19-kilometer uh, LRT that uh, Crosslinks Transit Solutions uh, was selected by Metrolinks and Infrastructure Ontario to design, build, finance, and maintain. Um, Crosslinks is the first Ontario P3 project to include community benefits as part of the project agreement. And this grew out of a, a, another first, um, a framework agreement between Metrolinks and the Toronto Community Benefits Network. So uh, Crosslinks has been very proud to be, uh, to be part of this first um, and to be able to um, be part of the, the leadership um, that has really piloted uh, community benefits on a large scale in on Ontario. Um, as I said, this is a requirement under our um, under our contract, um, and you know we're going to talk a lot today about jobs and employment. Um, but it is a um, uh, our program is com is more comprehensive than just that. Um, we've also uh, focused um, a lot of effort on training and mentoring, um, as well as um, local and social uh, procurement. Um, so, but I guess the, the key thing is that uh, the point to get across is that the Crosstown was the first. So there have been a lot of lessons learned. Um, we're very proud of the success that, um, that we've achieved, um, but our experience is also informing um, how, um, how more progress can be made on, on future, uh, future projects. Uh, th thanks, Kristen. And, and we recognize that it was the first, so uh, obviously, there's going to be some lessons learned, but before we have that discussion, and uh, certainly we like Lionel, hopefully Elise will be able to join us as well about lessons learned and how to improve some of these existing community benefits agreements, is what, what are some of the successes? So uh, you talked about mentorship, uh, apprenticeship, uh, local business opportunities. What are some of the successes Community benefit agreement has delivered on your project. Well, um, we have we have uh, achieved a significant amount of success in terms of employment, and that's both on um, professional and administrative and technical positions as well as apprenticeships. So, um, and and to to achieve that success, we've had to build um, partnerships. And this is a key point, and I'll bring it up again when we talk about the lessons learned and some of the challenges. Nobody can deliver community benefits on them, you know, alone. I mean, it is a requirement in our project agreement, but community benefits really requires a network. So we have been successful in, in, our, um, in our hiring and in bringing apprentices onto the job because of the partnerships that we've built with um, employment agencies, a lot of them local, uh, working with uh, unions and, 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 and working with the subcontractors um, as well. So um, almost a third of our direct hires, uh, um, uh, Crosstown is a consortium of um, Ellis Don, Acon, uh, Dragados, and SNC Lavalin. And, uh, and a lot of, them, of our employees come from those companies. But in terms of our direct hires, about 30% of them have come through our community benefit um, initiatives. So that's a real success. Um, do we want to do more, particularly in the area of apprentices? Yes. Um, but we have seen real, real progress, considering that this program was um, you know, started from the ground up. Um, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, local procurement, obviously the big budget items on a construction project like the Crosstown are not going to be procured um, from local, you know, local Eglinton businesses, but we, but we have um, established relationships. We've, um, we've invested millions of dollars or purchased goods and services and millions of dollars uh, from businesses along the alignment, as well as social enterprises uh, when we can. We, we also support local businesses through shop local campaigns, and um, we do a lot of partnering with area schools and, and pre-COVID sponsoring local um, community events uh, where we not only promote the Eglinton Crosstown project, but also the job opportunities um, as well. So again, it's, um, you know, we're proud, we're proud of this, and, but we know that we can, and, uh, that, that we can do better um, going forward based on the lessons that we've learned. Well, well, thanks, Kristen. I think we're going to talk about it a little bit uh, later in terms of the consortium. Yeah. The, the consortium 
does not have control over all the manpower that's on the, on the job site. And so the fact that over the direct manpower that you have control over, you've been able to achieve the, the kind of successes you have in offering jobs to, to folks who no, don't, wouldn't normally have an opportunity for that job is, is indeed a success. So, so thanks for that. So I see Elise has joined us from uh, Kansas City. Hello, Kansas City. Good afternoon. Hello. How is everybody? Good, good. So we had a discussion with uh, Lionel. He talked about his experience with community benefits from British Columbia and, and uh, Christian uh, with uh, Crosslinks and Eglinton Crosstown in Toronto. So maybe you could share with us uh, your experience uh, in, in Kansas City, but particularly you have a big airport project underway right now, mm -hmm. uh, Elise, and, and, and how is the community benefits program structured there? Oh, absolutely, Sean. We, um, we've had a couple different community benefit um, programs in a couple different projects, but the largest one you're right is a $1.5 billion project with a single terminal at our KCI Kansas City Airport. And um, the way it really is structured is it was negotiated. The, the, the community had to pass a vote to actually um, build the airport project. So with that, we believed that there should be some benefit for the community if they're going to be the ones to approve um, the, you know, not the funding, but to just approve the project. So we negotiated a community benefit agreement. And in that agreement that we negotiated with the city and the contractor, we had three phases regarding workforce. One of those phases with workforce was on workforce goals, which was to help the minority and female population. So we had a 20% minority population and a um, about 3.3% population for females. We've double the females and are meeting the goals of the minority. We have a, here in Kansas City or in the, in the United States, we also work with minority and contractor goals. So we have a 20% minority contractor goal rate and a 15% women business enterprise goal rate. And then we also have a pre-apprenticeship goal rate. And that's the biggest um, value because that's putting new hires, new folks into the workforce pool. And out of that, it is a pre-apprenticeship program. It's a three-week program kind of based off the North America Building Trade Union's three-week three, three training program. They go through it, and then after they graduate from there, they become an apprentice. They go out to work on the project. And it's a four-year project, um, and we're hoping to place somewhere between 160 and 200 new apprentices out there on that project. Um, so thanks, Elise. So 160 to 200 apprentices on that project. If you didn't have a community benefits agreement on Kansas City Airport, would you be able to place that many apprentices on the job? Absolutely not. We wouldn't, and we wouldn't also have the local workforce that we have on that project. It really has helped with the local workforce with those minority and women goals, as well as those, I doubt at all we would have those, um, not even a third of that. Um, we've had some smaller programs with not as lofty goals and we've never even come close. So having right now, currently in the pipeline, we just had our fourth class graduated and we have 66 brand new apprentices out on the job and it's really only been the fourth class. So we've got another um, two and a half more years of the program. And so, yeah, I could very easily see us meeting those goals of 200 and maybe even exceeding those goals, hopefully. Well, that's that's fantastic. And uh, so it's great to hear some successes from, from Kristen and, and from Elise uh, in Toronto and, and Kansas City of specific projects there. Lionel, what about in BC? Can, can you show us some examples of, of how the community benefits agreements uh, have worked well in BC? And plus on your other experiences, for example, on pipeline might be another good example, uh, Lionel. Sure, Sean, thanks. Uh, yeah, the, the model in British Columbia is really designed to uh, encourage people to enter the construction industry and stay there and go through their training or apprenticeship to, so that at the end of the day, they will have a career. So part of uh, the BCIB's mandate is to engage those uh, workers in these respective communities where these projects are going and start them in their training process and then ultimately see them through their careers. So, and, and, and if the project ends before their training is complete, then at that point, uh, they will be referred to other projects that will be coming online under the community benefits. So there's a continuum of training, a continuum of uh, care for these individuals that enter our industry. Probably the other piece of it that's really important that CIP. Sorry, 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 Lionel, I'm just gonna have to, there's some real background noise here. I wanna make sure everyone that's on the line is on mute. If you're not participating, if you're on mute, sorry, Lionel. No, no worries. 
So the other the other piece of it, uh, particular, not unique to British Columbia, but we've had some challenges uh, over the recent decades, is of course is um, all the unceded territories within uh, the province and and the areas um, of where these projects are taking place. Clearly, engagement with the indigenous communities and opportunities not only for them to work on these projects, but for their indigenous uh, contractors to have the opportunity to go to work on these projects. So. Um, there's there's avenues uh, and give priority to the indigenous uh, communities and their uh, community members to engage in this work. So we're seeing a, a great deal of uptake uh, from the indigenous communities. Um, in the other areas that we have uh, experience on across Canada, particularly in the pipeline industry, which um, you know spans borders across uh, across the country, we've had uh, great success. Um, in evolving our models so that we encourage people that traditionally wouldn't work in our pipeline industry to come to work for us. And why are we doing this? Well, it's just good business, frankly, at the end of the day. It's well documented that Canada is facing a skill shortage, as I said in my opening. And the real challenge we've found is that industry wants to come together as a group and address this issue, but there has not been any meaningful headway made uh, over the last 10 years in addressing this situation. So community benefits were structured in such a fashion that it would allow for um, you know, uh, women, uh, underrepresented group, the indigenous communities, which is one of the fastest and youngest growing uh, communities to enter our industry and start to fill and backfill uh, that gap that exists and will continue to exist over the next 10 years as many of our tradesmen men and women uh, retire from our industry. So in the pipeline industry specifically, Sean, I will say that uh, where we've had the greatest success is uh, working with the owner client, the Ambridges, the TC Energies uh, and others and identifying where the project's gonna go well in advance while it's still going through regulatory review. Uh, well in advance and we get into those communities and we start talking to those local residents or the indigenous populations about the projects and the opportunities that come along. And where we get the greatest success is where we've been in the field well in advance of these projects advancing uh, because we can identify those that are, have an interest to come to, uh, to our industry and we can start that preliminary training that would allow them to have the skill sets to be successful in the industry. Well, well, great. Obviously, some successes there, not only with some commercial construction projects, but also in the pipeline industry. And I think you're you're touching on one of the keys to success is in terms of uh, early work with the community where the jobs are going to be created. And I, and I think that dovetails nicely into some of the that Kristen want to talk about in terms of lessons learned. So, so maybe Kristen, you could talk about some of the lessons learned from from your experience on Eagleton Crosstown. Yeah, so I, th I think I mentioned in my opening remarks that, that, that a successful community benefits program is really about a network. It's not about any one individual uh, organization. And, um, and you know, each, each organization has an important role to play in reducing barriers uh, for people who've been left outside of the workforce and prepare them for a job in construction. Obviously, Crosslinks as a major employer is critical uh, but there's others. There's um, the unions and the pre-apprenticeship programs, the subcontractors, and, and Toronto Community Benefits uh, Network um, with respect to, um, uh, to our project. Um, recognizing that it does take a village, for our project, uh, Crosslinks, Metrolinks, TCBN, and others actually signed on to a joint declaration committing all the players uh, to work towards a goal of having 10% of hours worked on the project uh, be carried out by apprentices and journey persons um, from historically disadvantaged and equity seeking groups. So really recognizing that there's a collective responsibility um, uh, to achieve, you know, to achieve the goals around uh, community benefits. Um, so that, that in and of itself, trying to get everybody focused and moving in the same direction can be challenging. Um, and figuring out, and, and of course, being the first project and figuring out how to put all these pieces together, you know, took time. It took time. Um, uh, we, had a, we had a pretty steep learning curve and we had to spend a significant amount of time to get the program up and running. We had to educate ourselves and our subcontractors, work with the unions and the pre apprenticeship programs, and, you know, 
developing systems for tracking and reporting. You know, it was all new. And well, I mentioned that we have been very successful um, in, in terms of um, our direct hires um, for our self-performed work uh, in terms of apprentices, and then as well as you know a whole other part of our workforce with pro you know with professional administrative and technical jobs. We've not seen the same level of results through our subcontractors. Um, uh, we have, I, I know I'm jumping ahead a bit, um, but we have to date 162 apprentices on the job through our community benefits program. And that breaks down to 128 that were hired directly by CTS and 34 through our subcontractors. So, and I, and I should say we have hundreds of subcontractors and I don't say that to minimize um, the, the 34, but it's more to my next point, um, which is um, this is new. Um, and um, we at Crosslinks had a dedicated community benefits person. Um, uh, we had labor relations and human resource staff mandated to work on community benefits. And I think that, you know, and that is and that, that those resources and that focus um, demonstrate, you know, the success that we, we have had. And I think that, you know, one of the lessons that we've learned is that, um, there needs to be more engagement in education with the, the folks who are responsible for hiring, you know, for bringing the apprentices on in the unions and the subcontracts, and not just in our commercial agreements. It needs to be done with the people in those organizations that are involved in, in the hiring decisions and getting people onto the project. You know, they don't have the resources that we, we had, you know, um, uh, uh, to focus on community benefits. So we see that as, as very important. And you know, Lionel made the point too about the upfront work. In P3 contracts, as everybody knows, a significant amount of the technical work is done in advance, right? It's how the you know the procurement is is um, is organized. And we think that more upfront work could make um, community benefits uh, programs more successful, so that when the contract is awarded and 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 you know financial close is achieved. Um, uh, there's more of an ability for the constructor uh, and the partners um, to um, uh, in the community and the stakeholder groups to hit the ground running, um, and and so that has been um, that has been one of uh, one of the uh, significant challenges that we faced. Right. So specifically, some challenges on the subcontractor side because you have, as you indicated, hundreds of subcontractors on a project of that size and scope, but. It sounds like nothing that can be overcome with advanced planning and communication. So that seems to be in alignment with what Lionel was saying earlier as well. Elise, what about in uh, Kansas City? What 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 are some of the challenges we're having there and some lessons learned? Is, uh, are you, you feel like you planned well enough in advance? Yeah, um, to Christian's point. It is a, a collaboration and you it took us 18 months to really have the right agreement that really benefited everybody. And part of that is so every sub has, depending on how many hours in their scope, it's about 66,000 hours. I felt they they are they are their goal and part of their contract is to hire one of these pre apprentices. So because what always was the failure before is. There wasn't, you know, we the, the contractor and the general was all on board, but you have to get the subs to also agree. And unfortunately, sometimes goals don't necessarily get them to agree. It's when it's part of your contract. But the weakness of the strengths besides just that subcontractor part that Christian made was we also provided reliable transportation. We also are providing daycares, not not full time daycare, but on scopes of work, like I'm a concrete finisher, if I need to start that project and pouring concrete at four in the morning, we're paying for that daycare to open up at 3.30 for those um, employ for those great employees to be dropping their kids off to get before they go to work. And then the transportation is beneficial to everyone on that project. So everyone in partnership with collaboration with our KC Area uh, Transportation um, Association, they're able to drive, take the bus up there. Those are all pros, but unfortunately the weakness is that when that scope of work is over for that apprentice or that journeyman on that project and they have no transportation and that project, the contract wants to move them across the city, they don't have a way to get there. So some of the biggest strengths have also been some of the weakness for the success of the apprentice, but overall it's really worked out well and really worked out well for the subs. Right, so so obviously that's a really good point. Well, Obviously, there's um, you know, planning that needs to go into place that we've talked about. 
but there's also some real tangible supports that are needed, uh, transportation and, and, and daycare to, to name but a couple. So that's interesting and in how you've been able to work that around on the project in Kansas City. But what happens thereafter, I guess the hope is that the apprentice or the, the group and the individual that gets an opportunity on a project is able to establish the credit ratings and have the cash flow to afford a vehicle or higher orders of transit to get to and from work. So I guess it all starts with a job and, and you know where they take it from there is, is largely uh, up to them. I'm just uh, thinking that we're, we're having a good discussion here, but there have been some questions uh, from the audience uh, related to what we're talking about here. So maybe I could start um, uh, with uh, you, Elise, and, and then I got a separate question for uh, for uh, Lionel, and the same question, same question for Elise and, and Kristen, and then uh, a separate question for Lionel. What kind of reporting structure is there, uh, Elise, on the job to make sure that the the targets are being achieved, and are there penalties for not hitting targets? And the same question for you, Kristen. So yes, there are targets, especially on the workforce in the MBE, WBE. Um, those two targets are, are administered by the city of Kansas City, Missouri and their HR department, human resource department. So, um, so they, human relations department. So they're going to monitor all that. And yes, there are first, you know, first we start with the penalty of having to do the right training to make sure that they understand workforce needs and, and making sure that your program is diverse. And then, but there are penalties on liquidated damages, um, not just for the airport, but on any projects when you're not meeting your workforce goals or your MBWB goals. As far as the pre-apprenticeship program, that's kind of, we developed all this before COVID. And now with COVID, um, we're a little concerned about, you know what I mean, putting new folks on and folks wanting to actually go to work in this essential, we're essential workers, but it's also a tough environment. So um, as far as the pre-apprenticeship goals, we do not have any um, penalties if they don't meet those goals as of yet. Okay, so you do have some penalties uh, related to what specific targets, Elise? The workforce goals of 20% minority and 3% female, as well as the, the contractor goals of meeting the minority and women contractor goals of 20 and 15. There are penalties with the city on, that, on those. And how do you track those? How does the project track them? Do they track them, submit them to the Kansas City Airport Authority or... Uh, the city of Kansas. Where, where no, it? Literally, it, it goes through. It goes through the general contractor. And it's all submitted to the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and those those work those they literally are reported daily and weekly. Every day they're reporting how many how many how many uh, feet are on the ground, how many boots, as well as how many minority you know and people of color and how many women are on the job, and all of that is tracked daily um, to meet those goals and monitor the project. So I, I think you characterize those as some pretty hard and fast uh, targets and penalties. Uh, Kristen works a little bit different on uh, Eglinton Crosstown, right? Yeah. So 20% um, uh, of the Crosstown is self-performed. 80% is subcontracted. We have passed down our um, uh, apprenticeship uh, obligations uh, to the uh, to the subcontractors. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we have the um, collective uh, goal of 10% of uh, job hours to be carried out by apprentices that have come on uh, through our community benefits program. Um, the subcontractors are required to report, uh, report to us um, uh, monthly as they uh, on their on, on the uh, on their hiring uh, with respect to community benefits. This has been validated by our labor relations human resource people. There are no penalties. There are no um, there are no penalties or targets under our in our project agreement, and there are no penalties or um, targets for our um, subcontractors. Uh, other than, um, uh, of course, um, we are working towards that ten percent um, that that ten percent objective. Right. So. I think maybe, you know, to contrast the two in Kansas City, hard targets in uh, cross links, Neglin and Crosstown, aspirational targets. Is that fair? Yes. And, that, that's, and, and you know, a concerted effort, best effort. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just trying to draw the distinction between the two of them. Lionel, um, <clears throat> for you, like you, you represent the International Union of Operating Engineers. And I, I prefaced at the beginning uh, of the session that this was an election issue in, in BC, and uh, and I think that the you know much of that was kind of 
contrast between a union perspective and a non-union uh, perspective on, on community benefits. Uh, can you talk about the myth that community benefit agreements, this is from the audience, that community benefit agreements are for union contractors only? Yeah, there's there's two myths, uh, Sean, and thanks for raising that. There's two myths that uh, are put forward uh, in BC, and uh, just to be clear, it was an election issue and is also a charter challenge uh, on the validity of the uh, government to enter into these particular agreements. Both uh, stood the test of time. Uh, the two myths in British Columbia is 85% of the workforce is excluded. Uh, from these projects. And the other myth is 85% of the uh, contractors that work in British Columbia and tender work are excluded. And both are false. Uh, simple fact is anybody uh, can work under this community benefits agreement and anybody can tender under this, uh, under uh, the community benefits in British Columbia. And the advantage of the BC model is the fact that because BCIB is the employer, we can actually track through the generals and all of the subcontractors the objectives that have been put forward out, put forward by the provincial government. And all of those uh, statistics can be tracked in real time. Matter of fact, BCIB has a, uh, has a dashboard on their website that shows the hours of work that are, uh, that are completed. But the challenge, um, there's, there's a group obviously that uh, are not in favor of community benefits and the way that the government has deployed this. And what we found was interesting in the early days on some of the road building contractors, uh, there was a small number of contractors that came forward to bid, mostly union contractors, signatory with the building trades. And as the work has continued to evolve and tender, we're seeing more and more contractors now bid because they understand that uh, the work is there. The, the playing field has now been leveled with respect to uh, wages, benefits, and terms and conditions of employment because it's under a central contract. And uh, we're seeing more and more uh, competition starting to come into the marketplace. The interesting thing as well is that um, the provincial government, I'm told, uh, put a 7% risk factor on labor costs because of community benefits. And so far to date, all of the uh, contracts uh, that have been tendered, the uh, risk profile for uh, labor has been under 7%. Uh, the first contract was a uh, 5% premium. The next contract, frankly, the contractor left a lot of money on the table. It was 50% lower. But uh, uh, as we've moved forward, we're seeing increased competition. Uh, we're seeing, um, obviously, uh, people getting used to the community benefits and how they work. So the risk factor is declining. And we're achieving all the goals that uh, were contemplated by the provincial government. In contrast, into the general marketplace, I can tell you there's certain parts of the province, uh, you know, there's a hospital job up in northern British Columbia that only had one non-union contractor bid on it because all the contractors were busy. And so, you know, uh, where's the fair value in that? Uh, so this way, through the community benefits, through BCIB, we're starting to see greater competition and we're also seeing uh, more interest uh, in, in the industry and within the communities that these projects are being built in. So community benefit agreements are agnostic to, you know, the labor arrangements that contractors have. They could be union, non-union, or, uh, or no, no agreements, open shop, or, or alternative union. Uh, and you're seeing increased competition. Uh, what, what about, uh, maybe you can flesh this out a little bit more, about the costs of community benefits. And, you know, there's been some reports about how much community benefit agreements cost uh, to an overall project and and increase costs? Can you just comment on that, on that a little bit further, Lionel? Yeah, there's there's been some reports that some of the, the one project in particular, uh, the uh, Patello uh, replacement project, uh, is 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 over budget, and uh, none of it has to do with labor or the agreement, uh, the community benefits agreement. Uh, we had a larger than normal runoff this spring in the Fraser River. Uh, we call it the freshet and the freshet was higher than normal and uh, that caused some delays in getting permitting and allowing the contractor and the consortium to get into the into the Fraser River to start doing their foundation work. So that was one of the costs. And the second one that's mostly that doesn't get reported on all that much and I'm sure it's been part of the uh, the conference as whole is COVID and, and its impact on the supply chain. So, you know, we're not apologetic that uh, labor costs have gone up slightly 
uh, under these agreements. We tell we we say that uh, the government contemplated when they put it in place with a seven percent risk factor, but none of the projects have been tendered today have hit that seven percent risk factor. So, uh, in in real terms, on the labor components that we're familiar with. Uh, we're, we're coming, we're slightly higher at the beginning, but it's all coming back in line as more competition comes uh, comes to the fold. Okay, great. Well, well, well thanks for that. I, I think that's important to, to get that um, information out there. At least uh, maybe to switching gears for a little, little, little bit here. You talked uh, at the onset about uh, the pre-apprenticeship programs and, and the training. Uh, how important is that to the success of the of the project and how do you determine when you have that intake, what trade that person is going to go into? So we do several initial interviews. The first initial interview is just to see if they qualify because the qualifications of, of every apprenticeship program is a little bit different, but most of them you have to be 18. 60% uh, of them have a high school plumber GED. We go through that and then we literally give them a list of trades that they are interested in. We also do a math test because some of the trades like the IBW ha really require a high level of math where someone like myself, a cement mason, I need to know ge geometry, but not near the level of math like some of the other trades. So depending on where you test on your math sco scores also allows you to apply for certain programs when you get, and that's through the interview process. So the second interview is where the contractors come in and interview the um, candidates that have already said, I wanna be an iron worker, or I wanna be an electrician, or I wanna be a concrete finisher then they're interviewed and then there's only so many numbers like the last class we just had, which graduated last Friday was 18. Um, there were only two electricians in that class, but there were four, um, there were uh, four um, bricklayers, there were two cement masons. So it depends the scope of the work too on what, you know, some of the trades if you wanna be a painter, it's gonna be another two years probably before we put painters on that project. So all of that kind of goes to what's best for that individual. Cause it really is about transformation of this individual for the rest of their lives of getting them on the right career path where they're going to be like you or anybody else or me on this call where we've made a good career out of our our, our being in the trades okay great well uh, and Kristen, i think you were th thanks for that at least you were saying earlier about you know planning ahead of time and and working with the community and, and unions and, and subcontractors the kind of intake process that's a occurring in Kansas City, is that something that you would recommend be replicated uh, on, on future large infrastructure projects uh, in Ontario or across Canada based on your experience with Eglinton Crosstown? Sure, having a pipeline of candidates is a is a a key you know a key uh, criteria uh, for success. Um, you know, Elise, you know what's going on in Elise's project is different than ours. I mean, when when apprentices. You know, we, we take apprentices after they've been, or subcontractors take them after they've been through that kind of program and they have selected a trade and have signed up with a with a union. But um, certainly having um, uh, a coordinated pipeline or, or pipelines, um, uh, and not just for the benefit of those that are hiring, but also for the uh, for people who are trying to get into the into the construction, so that they understand what that pathway is. You know, perhaps they don't have the um, numeracy or literacy skills that, um, in order even to um, get into a pre-apprenticeship program. And so, to have that kind of pipeline um, uh, available for candidates, and then also it, it hugely um, benefits uh, the employee employers um, at the other end, the employers like Crosslinks and our, and our, and our subs. Um, uh, so that is, that, that, is, that is a real, really critically important and, and really um, what I'm talking about when I'm saying that we need to have a network, right? Because um, it's not like Cross, and, and for our project, Crosslinks is not doing that pre-apprentice -pre training. It's others that need to do that, right? Um, uh, so, that's, so that is incredibly important. Okay, great. I'm interweaving questions. Maybe you could tell because we rehearsed this call and it's going nothing like the rehearsal. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm interweaving questions from from the uh, from the audience, and so one of them, uh, Kristen, is that do you think that you would have? Uh, and I know this. If if this kind of puts you on the spot a little bit too much, uh, you know, no problem. We maybe we kick it over to someone else. But um, the question is. What incentive is there to even achieve aspirational targets if there is no 
um, penalties in the contract if you don't achieve the aspirational target. So, so okay. You know, so I'm first. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna answer that based on our the, the cross of uh, the crosslinks perspective and our experience and what we've delivered. Um, uh, not having not having the 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 hard targets and the penalties. Um, we as a constructor, as a you know a large consortium, we have delivered. So it is possible. Um, it is it is possible to do it and to uh, to be successful. And as I as I said earlier. Um, you know, it's not enough. We recognize it's not enough just to have commercial terms in a contract with the subcontractors. You need to get down to the level of people who are, are, are making the hiring decisions. And we know that, um, you know, we've worked on that, but given the, the, the time frame that we had, the number of subs that we have working on the project, you know, we haven't been as successful um, as we uh, uh, want to be. Right, we've had all of these resources dedicated, and and I would, and I, but I want to qualify that too. I, I'm not that hasn't been a substantial expenditure on a 5.3 billion dollar project. The the investment that we've made in um, uh, in community benefits in terms of the the resources that we put into it, it's it's not a you know it's not a, a huge amount of money, but um, uh, could targets penalties. Um, Perhaps um, that's not the model that we've, you know, we've been operating under, and we've we have um, we have uh, as crosslinks we have achieved success, some success, recognizing that there's areas to improve with the subcontractors. Okay, great. Well, uh, time has flown, and thanks very much for a very uh, honest answer there, Christian. Really appreciate that. So, in a minute or less, um, why community benefits, and maybe a quick story of a success, uh, Lionel. Yeah, Sean, I, I, you know, there's many successes, but I think the one I'd like to point, point towards is uh, in the province of Manitoba through 40-year uh, history, 40-plus year history of utilizing a uh, community, community benefits type agreement uh, for the hydro generation and the building of the many dams and, and generating stations in the province of Manitoba. Um, we've seen engagement with Indigenous uh, communities and, and, and um, you know, a diversification of the workforce. And our particular membership in Manitoba is, is for those that self-identify, is now 40% Indigenous uh, peoples who have come through the pro through the contracting process and through the community benefits agreement, and have stayed with our local union and have made a career out of uh, out of construction. And they say that's a very proud legacy, as far as I'm concerned, uh, because those projects were very complicated, required the the uh, cooperation of many different communities, and as a direct result, many people have found a career in our industries. Great, thanks, Lionel. Uh, Kristen, in a, in a minute or less, and then Elise. Sure. Um, well, I, as I said earlier, 30% of our direct hires, um, and that's, you know, to over 200, uh, about 210 professional administrative and technical positions, almost 130 apprentices, um, uh, we've hired through our community benefits program. So that's a success. As I said, 30% of our, of our direct hires. Um, and, and just to uh, quickly, just to, to make it a little more personal, well, early on when we were doing, when our major work was excavation, it was messy. We set up um, um, a window washing program with Building Up, which is a social enterprise that does pre-apprenticeship training. Um, during the course of that program, there were 4,500 paid labor hours. Um, and 20% and of the building up uh, participants who joined the union after um, going through their apprenticeship program worked on that window washing, pro window washing program. We're like, you know, we're really, really proud of, of those, kinds of, uh, uh, those kinds of results. Great, thanks, Kristen. Elise, you got a personal success story for us? Uh, I have several, but I'll sum this one up real quick, Sean. Many, many years ago, we had a pre apprenticeship program that I got myself and started that I applied for and got accepted in. And I worked my way up the ladder from an apprentice team at Mason to a journeyman to the president of my local and now I head of the building and trades. These programs work. Our job sites have to look like the communities are being built in and they can be a success for anybody. So I appreciate the time today. Great. That's excellent. That's a fantastic testimonial way to end. Thank you everyone for participating. Thanks for those who joined us uh, online and on behalf of Canada's Building Trades Unions, uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference and stay safe.